Good morning, uh, I'm Malcolm Graham Wood and I'm here at Core London doing my CEO interview. And today my guest is Andrew Austin, but he's not a CEO. He's actually no. now, since we last spoke, uh, returned to the position as Executive Chairman of Kistos. Good morning, Andrew. Welcome. Good nice to see you, Malky. Again. Tell us about being back to being Executive Chairman before we move on. It doesn't particularly make any difference, but um, um, it, you know we, we've hired back um, a couple of people that work together all to work together at, back at Rockrose. Yeah. So Peter Mann and, um, uh, is now CEO, and, uh, and Richard Slape is now CFO, who will be known to many people in the industry. Um, you know, got the band back together, Malky. Yeah. Excellent. Good stuff. <coughs> uh, well, the band has got together and has um, uh, done a deal. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we were talking a little while ago about the business in general. That's not the plan for today, because uh, on Monday you announced the... Um, the announcement of the greater uh, Lagan acquisition from Total. Um, there's no need to go into many initial um, bits about, about Kistos. We all know about that. Let's talk about the GLA, the deal. And why don't you go start off by telling us the rationale behind it. We'll do costs and cash and everything else in a minute. Sure. But well, the background, please. So you know we're interested in, in gas assets. We're interested in gas assets with a low, gas assets, assets with a low carbon footprint, um, and in the hands of good operators. And so this fits exactly into the strategy of what we talked about previously. So um, Total wanted to divest of 20% of their holding. They wanted to get back down below 50%. They still retain 40% and operatorship of this whole area. Um, uh, and we saw this as an opportunity for Kistos. Um, all the wells are subsea tiebacks back to um, the Shetland gas plant. Um, we also own 20% of, or we'll own on completion, 20% of the um, uh, Shetland gas plant as well. Um, and so this means, while it's not, the carbon position is not as low as our operations in the Netherlands, it's still well below North Sea averages, which is a great place to be. Production this year estimated to be around 6,000 barrels of oil equivalent, uh, with upside in Glendronach and in Ben Riach, um, that that can grow. Um, Glendronic is a is a is a development which will get um, a final final investment decision sometime later this year or next year. Ben Riak is an exploration well, um, um, but a reasonably low cost exploration well. Um, so we think it's a good package which suits where we stand. And also we're buying it with an effective date of one one twenty two, which means we get immediate access to the current ga high gas prices in the way in which we structure the deal. So, um, thank you very much for that. How did you finance the deal? Uh, what did it cost in total, per barrel, et cetera, and, um, and, um, and following that, where, where is your cash, your cash position from December, now it's running through the cash during the first quarter and, and, and once it's uh, completed? How long do you want that answer to be, Malky? <laughs> I, I mean, I've written down my notes as to all the bits of that answer. <laughs> okay, let's, okay, so let's just try and, let's try and go through it. If I miss bits, please tell me. Understood. So we're paying $125 million. So that's about 105, 110 million euros. So everything else we talk about is generally in euros because you know, that's where we've been based out of um, um, the Netherlands. Um, we had on the balance sheet at the end of the year 77 million um, euros, which we've talked about. But I think it's worth looking um, at what the cash build up through the second half of last year was. So at 30th of June, we had about 56 million euros um, in the bank. We then, in July, production was quite low because we had compressor issues um, on the um, third party platform that we export our gas across. Those, then through September and October, there was planned maintenance on that platform. So we had very little production through September and October. We then produced at a good rate through November, December, sorry, September, um, through October, November, and December, we produced at really good rates. And we produced, on a cash basis, over 40 million euros through that period. Um, but in fact, that doesn't include December, where we got paid another 32 million euros for our December production. But that money didn't arrive until January. So that doesn't feature in that 77 million euro position. Right. So we're already got more money on the balance sheet than we need to buy to pay for this. Yeah. The other um, part to that is that the effective date of this transaction is, is the 1st of January 2022. So 
all of the cash flows that build up in the total assets between now and the time of completion, which we expect to be sometime in the second quarter. So imagine that's at the end of the second quarter, yep. the end of um, uh, June. We expect to have more than 60 million of picked up in cash flow through that period, in addition to already having the money on the balance sheet that we've got yeah, now, which pays maybe, for it, yeah. and the additional money we're earning from, um, um, from uh, the queue area right now. Yeah. So, you know, there was some speculation at one point that, well, we can need to need to do a fundraise. Absolutely not. No need to do a fundraise whatsoever. Um, we've got plenty of cash around. Um, and it's, you know, we've done, we've structured deals like this in the past. You'll remember us doing things like this at Rock Rose. Yeah. Um, uh, so, you know, we're very well capitalized um, and we're very excited about the opportunity. Okay. So some people like to look at these deals in terms of, uh, of how much was it done? What, what did it cost per barrel, per barrel equivalent? But more importantly, in in your case, the uh, the gas price, which has been so going through the roof in the last uh, eighteen months or so, uh, and we talked about cash coming off uh, in our last interview. More importantly, people are concerned that you've done a deal with a seller who's pricing the uh, the, the asset at two hundred uh, pence per therm, and yet um, you know we may find that that comes down a bit and. In the markets, you'd expect anything to happen. Have you have, have you done? Have you found yourself, you know, in receipt of a, a deal at two hundred, or did you? No, absolutely not. A different price? We, we we did the sums at um, under a hundred pence a therm, basically, to justify where we stand. Um, and in fact, you'll notice in the R and S, um, we have additional consideration to pay to Total in the event that the price through twenty twenty two average is more than 150 pence a term. So there's a sort of sliding scale from that up to a maximum of, of um, 40 million, which is, uh, implies that the, the gas price is way over two, two pounds a term. Yeah. So you know, our assumption and Total's assumption was a much lower number. And then we basically gave them a kicker um, so that in the event that gas prices remain high and we all benefit, we yeah. get 60% of that benefit and they get 40% of that benefit. Excellent. Um, you mentioned in, in your run through earlier on about reserves and production. So, sort of my next question was going to be what does this acquisition add to Kistos in general? Say, it, does it another 50% of the reserves and production? And um, I, w I was also going to ask whether it stays in line with your your low carbon footprint. You sort of mentioned that, but, but reserves Okay, so let's talk about production. It doubles our production. Yeah. Yeah, so um, it adds another 6,000 barrels to our production. So we're going to be about 13,000 barrels a day uh, mm -hmm. through 2022. Um, it adds 6.5 million barrels to our reserves. So that's not doubling our reserves. That's less than doubling our reserves. But obviously, this is a more mature field than the fields we're currently producing from. Yeah. Um, and... Um, it, on the carbon basis, it comes in about 12, 13 um, kilos per BOE against an, um, a North Sea average of around 20, 22 kilos per BOE. So it's not as um, low carbon as, uh, um, uh, as the Dutch assets, but it is still on the right side of that mix. And it means that our production will be weighted at around six, dollars, uh, six kilos per uh, BOE. Excellent. And um, we've talked about the cash flow. Um, but you would be more than happy, you know, at, at, at anything above 100, you're, you're, you're doing well out of it, but it looks like it's going to be happier than that, so you'd be pretty confident about that. Well, I mean, at, at current gas prices, at the forward price, this pays for itself in a little, a little over a year. Yeah. Um, so, you know, given that it then continues to produce into, you know, the late 2020s, yeah. everything beyond the end of 2022 effectively is, is yeah. you know, Bunts for the company and and and, and, and the just for people who, who don't always do the sums that you do, a two hundred pence per therm is equivalent in oil price terms to two hundred you know, bucks a barrel. Basically, yeah. I mean, a barrel. It, I mean, there, it, it's not quite. You can't quite multiply like that because of the exchange rate. But broadly speaking, you know, as a rule of thumb, yeah, two hundred pence a therm is two hundred bucks a barrel. Right. Um, thank you for that. I wanted to ask about Glendronach and Benriac. So. You mentioned them again briefly. Um, can you talk us about talk us through both those assets, which are, have been highly written up in the in, in the old press recently? Yes. So, um, so Glendronic, um, Glendronic was a discovery some years ago by Total. It was initially thought to be quite a lot bigger than it ended up being. 
They've now drilled a couple of wells into it, and they've come up with a, um, a lower cost um, uh, development plan for that. Um, and you know, we're obviously buying into it not at the expectations of it producing a TCF worth of gas, but on much lower numbers than that. Um, so that's a nice fill up to where we stand. The other advantage of getting Glendronach online is that it extends the life of the, um, um, the Shetland gas plant. So, right. so what happens here is the, the more gas you can put down the pipe to the Shetland gas plant, the longer you can keep the plant open. Yeah. At the moment, you would actually cut off production before the theoretical end of production, just yeah, because yeah, you can't yeah, justify that, getting it through the Shetland gas plant. So you decommission Shetland gas plant earlier. If you get Glendronic on, yeah, that lengthens the life of Shetland yeah, gas yeah. plant, and therefore it lengthens the life of the rest of the assets within the GLA, the Greater London, uh, London yeah, yeah. area. Um, if you then bring Ben Riak on as well, which obviously is is exploration, yeah. yeah? But if, if, if Ben Riak comes on, then again you lengthen it. So it has a sort of a double whammy positive effect in that you, you pick up on, um, on, on the other assets as yeah. well as getting the benefit of the production from those on their own. So could you tell us when you're expecting to, to do the, the FID for, for Glendronic and, uh, and, and the timing on Ben Riak on drilling and so on? Um, the timing on Ben Riak has not been agreed yet with the operator, yeah? But it's going to be within the next two years that that decision is taken. Um, and we expect the decision on um, Glendronic hopefully later this year or the beginning of next year. Good stuff. One of the things that came up as a result of this acquisition is all about hedging. And I think that really the, the, the best way is for me to ask you, you know, beforehand you, you and I think a number of other people have already said that you hedge your capex for the following year so that you've got you're in a position where you know, you're, you're safe and sorted, but you're not taking any risks. The punters are in there because they want the upside. You own 30% of the stock, you're the same. They don't want it all hedged away. There have been so many different stories in the, in the, in the press, in the Twitters that I get and everything else about, about hedging. You know, have you, do previous hedges expire? And the, you know, can you just put into, you know, it might take a long answer, but can you just tell us about the hedging situation at Christos sure. now? Okay, so firstly, hedging policy, you're absolutely right. The policy that we adopted here and the policy we adopted previously at Rockrose was hedge to ensure that you can honour where you stand with your partners in your, um, uh, in your capex. Yeah? So you have to make sure that you can do the capex you've committed to. So, for instance, when we were at Rockrose, we hedged to make sure we could afford the Aaron development. Yeah? Um, yep. Here... Um, we hedged to make sure that we could do the workover program and the drilling of Q11B um, through the back end of last year. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so we hedged um, about 20% of our production at 25 euros a megawatt hour, yeah? Um, which is considerably below where the market is now. The market now is about 80 euros a megawatt hour. That hedge rolls off in March. So we've only yep. got a month left of that hedge. Yep. Yeah. Um, That's the one I was thinking about that expires, yeah. It expires in March. There is no new hedging being put in place, yeah, uh, because we are not committed to any other capex at the moment. As yeah. soon as we're committed to other capex, we'll look at the, the possibility and the necessity for any hedging. But until that's the case, we won't. So the other thing is, if you're, if you're producing a barrel of oil and your OPEX is 35 bucks a barrel, yeah, and I'm thinking back to previous mm. incarnations, and it's the price is trading at 40 bucks, yeah? You need to hedge because you have much of a movement, yeah? yeah. You, can, you can be whipped very, very quickly into a negative cash flow position. We are not in that position. We're producing here, uh, you know, an average of probably below $10 a barrel and selling it at 200 yeah? yeah? So we're not going to get into that situation. And at any point we'd have hedged over the last two years, the last year, you know, at some point subsequently we'd have looked like idiots. So um, I think at the moment, and, and our institutional investors are of the view that they invest in us because they want to get exposure to the gas price. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think our strategy is fine, and we're fortunately producing enough cash that um, you know we're not tight for money. So it's not a it's not an issue where we need to protect the cash at bank. 
So um, that, yeah, I mean, that should satisfy everybody who's, who's concerned about the fact. I'm sure it won't satisfy everybody, yeah, Malcolm, but, <laughs> um, but I, think it's a rational, I think it's a rational response. Fair enough. I do too. I think that's uh, perfectly acceptable. Um, have I missed anything on, on the GLA before we move over? I would like to talk about the operational update briefly, and it's not what yeah. we're here for today. Um, have we missed anything on GLA? No, I mean, I, I yeah, just... I mean, you're, you're buying something which has been built already. Exactly, and I think, I think that's, that's an interesting point, and th which brings us into the, into the update. Um, developing, on the original plan, developing Q11B would have cost us about as much money um, as um, was just spent on buying 20% uh, of the GLA. Yeah. The advantage we have is that it, it, developing the original plan of Q11B would have taken us well into next year before we'd have had first gas off that, yeah? Yeah. We now have assets which are producing literally now cash flow that goes into our bank accounts in reducing the purchase yeah. price, yeah? So we are taking advantage of these high gas prices right now, yeah? yeah. Um, when we get to develop in whatever form Q11B, we'll be taking advantage of gas prices 18 months, two years yeah, yeah. down the road. So the good news is we, we've actually getting double bang for our buck on today's prices, which is really exciting. And if obviously, if the situation in, in um, Ukraine becomes more complicated, then that's going to yeah. se seriously be a payday. Um, yeah. So I think that's, you know, there is always a, advantages in actually buying stuff in the built environment, stuff that's already built. And... Um, because it's up and running, you've got a very good operator in place, um, and you haven't got the teething issues of, of bringing something new online. Yeah. And we see that with a number of other people in the North Sea right now. I mean, it's one of the nicest ways I've heard people describing a water wet, uh, slightly disappointing well, but it's true that you're now not going to do that. The rest of that development and, and so on, you're still going to... I mean, you, you, you've, you've still got oil, and you've still got hydrocarbons coming through the process. So you're going to do through one... Uh, platform, is that right? Well, we had three horizons, yeah? yeah. Um, we had the Schlopteren, which we produce out of, we produce out of that uh, reservoir in Q11, uh, Q10A already, yeah? So it just happened in this location, it was deeper and it was water wet. We then have the Zechstein and the Bunter above it, so two more levels above. Both of those have produced gas. What we've got to do now, so that's why we chose to suspend the well, not P&A the well, mm -hmm. um, is because we're going to go back. We've taken 50 metres of core out of the bunter. Yeah? We're going to look at that and work out what the best way to produce from that reservoir is. What fracking techniques, whether we um, uh, have a long lateral, um, what, what's the right way to do it? So rather than sitting there with the rig on site contemplating our naval, we decided to suspend the well, take the, um, uh, the rig off, have a good look at it in the labs, work out the right way to do it, and then come back once we've decided how much we can actually access. But the consequence is, is that it will be a smaller development and therefore will be a, a cheaper development and yeah. will be tied back into um, uh, Q10A. So the capex of the whole thing will be less, um, whatever happens if we take it forward, assuming we take it forward. Good, well, it's, it, it, it's turned out okay, which is, which, which is good. Um, I'm going to talk about M10 and M11. Because someone said to me the other day that there are payments coming up on that to Tulip and various things. Have you, have you got sort of pronounced strategy there yet? Well, we're doing a lot of work in the background on it. Um, it is, as we've all talked about before, it's a very sensitive area yeah. and needs to be dealt with sensitively with the local community. We started that community engagement. We need a license extension on that license. So that license currently expires um, in the summer. So we need to get a license extension on that before we apply an awful lot more money to where we stand. Um, um, we're talking about the payments with, um, uh, with Tulip at the moment. Um, so in you, would, of you would owe them, a, I mean, if we extend the license? If, if we extend the license, then we owe them $7.5 million, yeah. um, um, dollars, which is, you know, this money we've got and, and obviously budgeted yeah. for. And do you think the locals, is this one of those, I think it's going to cause more trouble than it's worth, or do you think you'll, you'll get it's them got, around? It, I mean, it's, it's just got to be done sensitively. You know, um, um, Others down the road, uh, one Diaz down the road, have um, managed to do it recently. 
um, and um, come up with a community package that works for the local community. Yeah. Um, you know, we're drilling from, we will be drilling from outside of the Natura 2000 um, limit, which yeah, is yeah. an important sensitivity. Um, but it does mean that, you know, we will be drilling back under the um, Natura, Natura 2000. Yeah. So that means we've got to be sensitive to what's going on there. It's all about engagement with the local community and making yeah. sure that there's something in it um, um, for them and that they can get comfortable. But I think, I think overall, across Europe, um, the events of the last six months, and it is only actually the last six months that these gas prices have really shot up, less than that, actually. Yeah. If you actually look back to the end of last summer, the prices were nowhere near as high as they are now. I think that whole squeeze and what that's meant for cost of living for people, what that's meant for political decisions, means that people do recognise the importance of gas close to home and the importance of, of, of gas independence. And uh, sensitively <clears throat> done. But it still needs to be sensitively done. Mm. And Vreeland is all OK across the board, so you're... Yeah, we're working, um, we're working with independent consultants to review our development plans for that at the moment, again, um, to, uh, um, to peer review our plans and make sure that um, they all make sense. Um, so that, that work's ongoing. So will you be doing an update to CPR on, on things or wait until... Because you've got, with the GLA, it's all, it's all CPR, I presume. Well, I mean, you've, you've the numbers, the, the numbers you see are, are operator yeah. numbers, yeah? Yeah. Um, so we're not reworking the operator numbers. I mean, I, to be honest, we probably won't do a CPR until there's a need for a, for a, a prospectus at some point, yeah? Um, you don't want one of those. Don't do but we don't want one of those at the moment. We don't need those at the moment. Yeah. So um, I, I think we're comfortable at the moment with, with the numbers we're working with. So I don't, I don't see a, an immediate need yeah. to do a CPR. Do another We're not deal? selling anything. No. <laughs> you got another deal or two down the line? I mean, uh, it's obviously things we're looking at. I mean, wouldn't be us if it wasn't, would it? I mean, I've, um, heard, I've heard people say that there might be things coming up with the um, the ACA BP um, deal, which is um, there. Are, there are certainly um, there are certainly some things up for sale in Norway at the moment. Um, um, you know, a couple of um, deals around that potentially the right sort of size for us, but it's always obviously about price. The advantage of Norway is that you do have very low carbon footprint because a lot of it is shore pad. Um, so your scope yeah. one, scope two fits very neatly into um, um, Kistos's position. We wouldn't go operated in Norway. We'd only go non-operated. There's no, um, you know, the complications of operating in Norway are too great. Um, and, you know, we're, we're ready to, ready to look at um, at anything that's sensible and at the right price. But, uh, mm. you know, we're not famous for overpaying for things, Malky. Ever yeah, thought of going to see Mitch Flagg and saying, you've got a deal with Serica? What a company that would make, Kistos and Serica together. Um, I have no need to have a conversation with uh, Mitch. <laughs> and he would tell you that he, he had no need to come over to do a deal with you because that's a lovely company and it's also doing well out of the gas price. But, uh, you know, I know people... He hasn't done a deal for a while, though, has he? He hasn't done a deal for a while, and um, and we know that there are various things that he could do. Obviously, he's got he's got some big ex exposure which he could do, but um, uh, but he's yeah. throwing off a lot of cash. It's good. It's yeah, like you go back to Total and buy a bit more. That's the other question. Uh, have they said to you by selling you twenty percent? No, I think uh, everyone's. I think the, the partnership's in the right place now. I think they're at the level that they want to be at. Um, um, we're happy with what we've got. I think. We're more likely to go and buy something somewhere else than, than deepen our position in a, you know, 20% of a West of Shetland development is, you know, West of Shetland when things, yeah. costs are expensive, right? And it's very deep ah. water. It's a very... Um, the people who look to West of Shetland would look at you now and say, they'd be pulling yeah. their, you know, petrified yeah. and people's pulling their hair out years ago. About and, and, you know, and we, you know, we've been West of Shetland previously with, with Foynhaven at, um, um, at Rockrose, you know. And then that was an FPSO, and mm. you know it's expensive and it's complicated. This is, this is, um, 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 you know, subsea tiebacks straight back into the Shetland gas plant. It's easier to the extent that anything is west of Shetland is easy. Um, you know, there are issues as, as uh, have been talked about on, on Glendronach about mercury, so there are additional costs associated with getting Glendronach gas yeah. um, um, uh, dealt with the mercury. We know about that. That's all budgeted in, in, into our numbers. Um, it's not. It's not new to us. Yeah. We, uh, we're aware of it. We come to the end of the time. I always ask you where you would like to see everything put in 
you know, 12 to 18 months' time. You know, we've been talking today about one specific acquisition primarily, and you said that there's more on today. How, how would you see uh, Kistos and Eero at his time? I did. More of the same, I think, yeah. I mean, just continuing to grow, using the strong cash flow we've got off our existing assets to deepen our um, penetration across the North Sea. Um, you know, uh, maybe some more in the Netherlands, maybe something in Norway, maybe something in the UK. But it's going to be generally driven by buying things that are already built. Yeah, well, that does make so much sense. And you might get a part in the TV series about Shetland uh, police officers, and you can just see you as an extra in the... Look, just because I've worn a jumper today. Yeah? Know, just, just make me <laughs> <laughs> um, Andrew, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure, Mel. I've been Malcolm Graham Wood doing my CEO or today Executive Chairman uh, interview, and my guest has been Andrew Austin of Kistos. Uh, it's been a delight to see Andrew again. Thank you very much for joining and look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye now.